Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. Thank you for being here, and I am going to begin a lesson tonight that I'm imagining I'm not going to finish tonight. And imagine that. And so I have set my timer for 43 minutes, and that's what I usually do, because then when the 43 minutes is over with, perhaps uh, uh, we'll hit 45 or so, and we'll be ready. And I'm going to read from Luke chapter number 11 and verse number 1, and I, I told you on Sunday that I'd be teaching on this subject matter, faith to pray. And that might sound goofy, but sometimes we pray and we just don't have faith, and Sometimes I've prayed and have not received, and I wonder if my faith is not enough. Sometimes I've prayed and I've not received, and I've wondered if God has said no to me. Sometimes I pray and I think, well, maybe it's just bad timing. So we're going to talk about all of those issues, and uh, we're going to talk about types of prayer, and that's why I think it might take me more than this, just this one lesson to teach this. And Luke chapter number 11 and verse number 1, we read from the scripture that we have often read from, now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, this is what is interesting, is that we don't have any record in Scripture of John teaching his disciples to pray. But obviously, he taught his disciples to pray. And this is what the culture of the day was. If somebody was learned or learned, uh, they would begin to teach and they would gather a following. And their, their followers would call them rabbi and they would live according to the dictates of whatever the rabbi taught. And oftentimes they would get baptized and take on the name of their rabbi. So it was nothing unusual when John the baptizer started baptizing. But what was unusual, he was baptizing them under repentance. And he wasn't baptizing them to follow him, but he was baptizing them to follow him which should come after him. So... John had taught his disciples to pray, and now Jesus' disciples says, we want to know what you say about prayer. So in James chapter number 5, we read a very emphatic statement, which we'll come back to at the conclusion of our remarks probably tonight. This is James. He's the bishop of the church at Jerusalem, which has somewhere between 60 and 100,000. Who's counting? So uh, this is where the church started. It was birthed there in the upper room, and he became the bishop, so he had a lot to care for. And he says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So we have that. If you're suffering, (laughs) if you're struggling, pray about it. If you're happy, sing songs. So we do that in church. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In other words, the consistent, persistent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much or is effective with God. And so we know here, just we grab out of this scripture is prayer isn't just I say something once or I ask just once, but it's persistent. And so I hope that at the end of my teaching tonight, maybe some of you want to become involved with our prayer team. And we have a group me, it's an app, group me is an app that uh, we have, and we use it for inner communication with inside the church, and we have our prayer team app. When there is a need, we just send out a notice on that app, and if you have your notices set up, it pops up on your iPhone or your Android, and you can pray for that need. And I think that is a very important thing, because we have needs that we don't have 
a, a, a forum to share them in church, or we can't wait till Sunday to pray for that need. Somebody has a need, uh, like the other night, uh, uh, Kevin went to the hospital and he needed a prayer. So we share it on the prayer team. We pray for one another. So the statement that I'm about to make is not of a scientific nature. And in fact, most of our relationship with God is not of a scientific nature. It's very unscientific. In other words, it's not so precise. We precisely know what salvation is or what is expected of us to have salvation. But a lot of what we do with God, it's kind of like, it's, it's a feel type of a thing. And during the course of life, everyone has a desire to connect with God. Even if it's just momentarily, we, we, we want to believe that there is a higher power that can impact our life. Even when I mentioned on Sunday, uh, well, I, it wasn't Sunday, it was Saturday. I mentioned a couple weeks ago on Sunday, the Stoics and the Epicureans where uh, Paul had ministered to them. The, the Epicureans said, well, we're just living for today and uh, we're going to be dead. And so let's just enjoy today. They still wanted to believe there was a God. But they didn't think that God had anything to do with their life. And when Paul finally showed up, he said, hey, there's a God that wants to have something to do with your life. He wants to be involved in your life, and he can give you eternal life. Yeah. And some of them followed him. And it may be but for a brief moment that people want to connect with God, yet the passion arises within your heart and my heart to connect with Jesus. We who sit in this house, we want to connect with him. I want to know that when I pray, he hears me. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I know he hears me because his word says he hears me. And sometimes I feel like he heard me. Anybody understand what I'm saying? It's, it's a, sometimes we pray and it just doesn't feel like he heard me. Are you listening? Hello? It's like speaking to your wife. And she doesn't say, uh-huh. <laughs> or husband. And, 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 you know, you at least want to grunt, you know. They're behind the newspaper or the magazine or the iPad or whatever, and you say something, and you want some kind of response because you don't want them to later say, oh, I didn't hear you. Of course, you don't ever have that happen in your relationships. That's just my issue because I don't communicate so good. But many are the times that I've heard an expression similar to that given by the disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. I wish I knew how to pray. And in recent days, I've heard this expression from people at the altar and others that I've met. They say, how do I pray? And for a myriad of reasons, we at times feel disconnected with God and restricted in our ability not only to express our need or desire, but to hear from God. Am I hearing from God? And I have at least a dozen, probably two dozen books on prayer in my shelves in my office that address the act of prayer. Some of the publications define prayer in a methodical way, helping the reader to format their personal prayer time. Like, I'm going to spend three minutes on, on praise and worship, and I'm going to spend two minutes on thanksgiving, and then I'm going to spend this much time on petition and this much on supplication. And, and they're very good because it gives us a format to construct our own prayer. But prayer is so personal. It's, you and I are not going to communicate with God exactly alike. My wife and I do not communicate with God anywhere near alike sometimes. Does anybody witness that the person that they live with and are closest with, you don't even, here, here was a story that I heard is that, uh, so my wife, she, if you're on the street, you can probably hear her. And I wonder if the neighbors don't hear her praying in the mornings. And my wife gets up first thing in the morning and prays. And me, I've got to get showered, shaved, and get my eyes open and the toothpicks in so they don't close again. And, and I've got to get my coffee and get to church before I pray because otherwise I could go back to sleep just like that. It's me. It's who I am. And, and then I'll talk, start out just saying, I love you, God, and how are you doing today? And, you know, it's, it's kind of a conversation, and it may get very intense, but uh, I remember Brother Anthony Mangan say that him and his wife pray a little bit together, but I, my brother and his wife pray together every day. But their prayer styles are very similar. 
and they'll spend an hour together together praying. Uh, uh, we would distract each other. My wife would think, come on, are you not motivated? And I would think, my, that's really intense right there. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm just trying to help us all out. Pastor Anthony Mangan said, he said, we're, we're trying to pray together and Sister Mickey's going, kumbaya, kumbaya, oh, kumbaya. And I'm saying, God, strike them dead. Move that mountain. And the, neither one of them could get their prayer done because they're so different from each other. And so my wife do pray, and I do pray about things together, but we have our own private prayer time. And so it's, uh, you know, it's a living, breathing thing, this prayer thing, and it's progressive. It changes in our lives, depending on the season in which we are living. There are times where I spend hours interceding for people, and there are times where I'm not interceding as much for people. I'm giving thanksgiving and praying for direction for me. And so you, we pray differently depending upon the need. So those books will give us those methodical things and others of the books I have tell dynamic stories of answered prayer and some give helpful information such as what hinders prayer or when to pray or where to pray or how not to pray. But a textbook is usually not the answer to an inadequate or unfulfilled prayer life. Merely reading an instructional manual on golf will not ac accomplish the task of mastering the golf game. However, information is important and in succeeding in the adventure. And the proper information is important in making prayer what it needs to be and what God intended it to be. Now, I want to go back to my golf game for just a minute. There are some of my friends that would rather play around with someone more of their speed. But not being a great golfer has not kept me from golfing. Or pursuing golf. Now, <laughs> the first time I went out to play golf, now you've got to understand, golf has evolved and clubs have evolved immensely. My original woods were woods. And my number one wood was probably about that big. And I remember the guys at work just kept saying, uh, you just need to go out and golf with us. And there's a guy, a painter named Donnie Harmon, and he said, hey, I got a set of golf clubs. I'll sell them to you for 50 bucks. Now you know how good they were. Because people can spend $1,000 on a driver now. But it's 50 bucks, and there's this bright yellow bag with a few clubs in him. And he and I and Blaze Holler went out golfing, and I can't remember who the other individual was. Well, uh, they didn't tell me how to golf. They just said, we're going to go out golfing. And we went out to Blue Heron, and we started golfing. And I just started hitting pieces of grass around and uh, hitting pieces of sand around and trying to hit it, you know. And, you know, I'm thinking swing, so, you know, it's almost a, a mixed up uh, baseball swing. And, and, but they, they did tell me one thing. You can't get more than nine points on a hole. So I knew to quit at nine. <laughs> and most of them, it was nine when I quit. And, and I went around with those guys, but they used golf terms and, and they gave instruction, but it was just, it was pieces of instruction. And I was very, very frustrated until I went with somebody that was patient with me enough. And then there was one time, in fact, my whole family, I took them for golf lessons uh, there used to be a golf course out where the dog track was, and we went out and took golf lessons, and it helped me a little bit. And then, what, but what really helped me is Pastor Dallas Brock went golfing with me, and he was a triathlete in high school, uh, baseball, football, and golf. He had a scholarship to go to the University of Arizona in Phoenix, did not go, but uh, so he was good at it. He made the team, and and this was what was neat is he would watch me and tell me what. I was doing wrong and how to correct it. And over the process of time, I got better and better. And then, of course, I bought some new clubs a couple years ago, and then that improved my game. And, and I went out with a friend last summer, and he said, you're getting pretty good, Steve. We're going to have to go out more often. Well, he hadn't invited me to go out in five years. <laughs> 
Probably because he got tired of waiting on me because he was enough better than me that it wasn't as fun for him as it was for me. And I, I remember telling you a few weeks ago that I, going out golfing with Brother Jason Dillon, who used to be an evangelist that now pastors in Mississippi, and uh, I ran out with him and he looked at me one time and he says, Elder, you're no better than you were the last time we went out. <laughs> and I said, you're probably right, Brother Jason. And he says, uh, I said, it doesn't matter to me. He says, well, if you're going to play it, then do your best. And I said, I'm not an evangelist. I'm a pastor. I don't have all day to play golf. I was just kind of poking at him. And he got th two birdies that day, and he, he's videoing it and showing, hey, baby. He's calling his wife, hey, Christine, I got a birdie. I got another birdie. And he's just going crazy. Brother Mark was out that day, I think, with you and I and taught him and Tony, maybe, or Todd, and having fun. But the point is, is that the more you play, the better you get, or you just give up. And so it is with prayer. If we don't somehow get instruction, or tutoring, or somebody to pray with us, you know how I learned to pray? I learned to pray by listening to my mom, and my dad, and my pastor, and some of the elders in the church. Every Saturday night was prayer meeting, and I'd go to prayer meeting. I didn't know how to pray, but I mimicked them. And sometimes by mimicking them, I learned they were passionate what to pray for. And, and thank God I was with people that knew how to pray. And we all pray differently. I remember being in my uh, wife's uncle's church, Brother Paul Reynolds, and he'd say, Sister so-and-so, lead out in prayer. Well, he had a bunch of Jamaicans in the prayer, in church. Oh, my. And Brother Reynolds could tell you. Oh, thou most gracious heavenly Father, thou who art greater than all, be thou exalted in the midst of thine people today. And it was just flower, proper English. It was just, it, it was a little shocking. It was like, I don't pray that way. It's just like, hello, God. But they had that proper English prayer. And uh, there's been a few people that have attended prayer here. It, it kind of, it, it shocked me just a little bit. Uh, Sister Anna Farifashinko, uh, when I asked her to pray, well, she's from Zimbabwe. And I'm thinking Zimbabwe. Well, she learned the king's English. And when she started praying, she was praying in the king's English. And it was like, whoa, I don't know how to pray. <laughs> she knows how to pray. That's how you pray. Well, and of course, we know Jesus gave them a pattern for prayer. Prayer is an art form that must be practiced, and it's an intimate encounter, and is very personal, and there is, no pa there is a pattern, but there's no patent on prayer that says, you've got to pray this way. Because you and I are all built totally different. We have different emotional makeup. We have different intellectual makeup. We have different way of processing everything. And so we've just got to figure out what works for us. But we're going to get some principles here, and we're going to get some promises, and we're going to get some scriptural understanding. So prayer, according to uh, Webster's Dictionary, would be, uh, uh, here's some synonyms for prayer. Entreaty, request, intercession, thanksgiving, praise, petition, or appeal. So those are synonyms, or words that mean the same thing, that they follow in the long, along the same line. So this definition is obvious to you and me, but it's not obvious that we seek. We need to learn to seek God. Prayer is a two-way street. It's never been God's intention that either we speak to him with no response or that he should speak to us mere mortals and leaving us no answer or recourse to speak back to him. Prayer is kind of, this is the way I look at prayer that helps me. And again, it's unscientific, is the Lord walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day and he spoke with them. Whether that was evening or morning, I don't know, and people will argue one or the other. But he walked with them and had conversation. It was a two-way thing. That's what God desires for you and I, and that's what I desire from God. I want God to talk back to me. Sometimes I don't like what he says, but I do want him to talk back to me. 
But I like that he talks back to me because sometimes he has to tell me, hey, smarten up. And sometimes he has to say, chill out. And sometimes he has to say, keep pushing on. And his spirit says that to me, sometimes just with a nudge or an understanding or maybe with a verse or a voice or somebody else speaks into my life after I have prayed for an answer. And when they say it, it just resonates in me and I go, oh, that's my answer. Since prayer is a vital link to communication between God and man, one would think it would be a priority in every Christian life. But often prayer gets pushed aside because of the other visible cares of this world. C.S. Lewis, maybe you don't know who he is, but how many know who C.S. Lewis is? Uh, my wife bought me something for Valentine's Day a few years ago. It was a cool gift. Uh, uh, it, it, he wrote a book called The Most Reluctant Convert. He was an intellectual that he was an atheist that became a Christian. And he's written a lot of books, screw tape letters, a, a lot of theological books. And, and uh, he wrote, uh, uh, what's the series? What? Narnia. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, which is a spiritual adventure in, you know, in dreamland kind of, which is really kind of cool. But he didn't believe in God. And eventually, it wasn't his intellect that convinced him with God, about God. It was his emotion that convinced him about God. But this is what he says about prayer. We, or at least I, shall not be able to adore God on the highest occasions if we have learned no habit of doing so on the lowest. At best, our faith and reason will tell us that he is adorable, but we shall not have found him so, not have tasted and seen. Any patch of sunlight in a wood will show you something about the sun which you could never get from reading books on astronomy. These pure and spontaneous pleasures are patches of God light in the woods of experience. And so he's speaking about his encounters with God in prayer is that we get little glimpses as we move along in our life with God. And so we become very, that's what forms who we are in our communication style with God is how we learn to interact with him. And we get into habits and we get into routines and it works for us. And so again, what works for you may not work for me and vice versa. And uh, I can drive down the road and sometimes pray, but usually I'm praying for people to get out of the way. So it's a, a very distracting thing for me to try to pray driving down the road. Okay, I'm just being honest, okay? Some people say, I pray on the way to work. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That, and you may be able to do that, but we need times where we can just focus on conversation with God and pausing to see if God will talk to us. And sometimes when I'm a long, a long trip, uh, if I, it's alone and I'm going 100, 200 miles, I'll just turn all the radio off and I will talk to God, especially I'm going Highway 58 or Highway 22 or something over into, East, into Central Oregon and I can just talk to God and then just stop and say nothing and hopefully God talks back to me, either through His Scripture that will come to my mind which his word is truth, and that's that you can take that to the bank, or I'll just get this sense of well being and say, okay, you've told God about that, that's enough. You don't need to talk to him about that again, or you've gotten that off your chest. Sometimes it just feels good to tell somebody, doesn't it? And that's part of the prayer, is just telling God how we feel. I remember reading a book, and you know, uh, Again, back to the patches of sunlight, there were some boys that lived with their scientist mother in Peru, and, uh, and uh, they lived deep in the forest, and they described the sun by the rays that came through the, the canopy of the rainforest, and, and, but their mother had lived elsewhere, and she tried to describe to them what the sunlight looked outside of the forest. And there was no way of them conceiving that until they walked outside the forest and then saw the bright glare of the sunlight. It's just like trying to show somebody what the sunlight is in an equatorial country compared to what it is here and how brilliant it is. It, it's just different. Trying to tell what a winter day is like here compared to where I grew up in the high desert of central Montana, just totally different. And you experience and go, wow, I see it now. And prayer's that way. 
Prayer is a place that we go that takes us on a journey that I believe all our life long we will be bumping into territories we've never been to. Now, that's the way I describe it. And again, uh, I'm not at all trying to put a guilt trip on anything, anybody today, but we're going to talk about four types of prayers over this week and next week. And, and we can get very specific in prayer, but don't feel guilty if you start in one place and end up in another place. Because as I have said many times, the Holy Ghost is pretty smart. And he can be taking you where he wants you to be so you can pray how he wants you to pray. So prayer becomes about what he wants as much as about what we want. Sometimes prayer seems to be an arm wrestling match trying to overcome the reluctance of God when really it's meant to be us uniting ourselves with the purpose of God. So what a wonderful way to describe us pursuing prayer, C.S. Lewis. It's those God patches of sunlight. So we need those times of encounter with the God of the universe. So prayer is the ultimate art of communication. And by communication, well, let me give you a, a definition out of the dictionary again. The act of transmitting or giving or exchanging information, signals, or messages as by talk, gestures, or writing, the information signals or message. So in other words, when we're communicating with God, we may just say, God, I, God sees your hands going up like that. Mm-hmm. Now, it's hard for me to understand that God is, and he is everywhere present, and he can pay attention to me while he's paying attention to you. And he can assimilate and disseminate information simultaneously because he's God he's the God that thought all of this up and then finally said it I wonder how long he waited to say it in the beginning yeah it's how how long he anticipated saying let there be light that's that's staggering to think about because we don't have a timeline because time is is in the construct of our universe and it's measured by the heavenly bodies now light was here before the heavenly bodies came but they're given for times and seasons and months and years etc etc but it's all going to melt with fervent heat and then we're going to be in his presence forever and ever and ever and ever and there will be no time so there's no measurement now that blows my ever-loving mind it just and sometimes it makes me anxious because I say, ah, 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 I live forever. I don't know about this. And other times I say, yes, when I'm in the presence of God, I want to live forever because we feel at peace with Him and we feel that oh, I'm right where I should be. And we go, oh, I could take this again and again and again and again. It's almost like having another bowl of ice cream, knowing you're not going to get too fat. <laughs> So here's some synonyms with communication, and, and words are important. Speech, talk, but I want you to listen to the progression. Utterance, announcement, revelation, discussion, dialogue, communion, interaction. So here, here's a couple antonyms, or which antonyms are words that's, that mean the opposite, and this will help us understand. It says, concealment, censorship, and withholding. So in other words, when we're in the presence of God, we're revealing our heart to Him, and we're wanting Him to reveal His heart to us. We're in the presence of God. We're communicating to him. Uh, touch communicates. I saw you elbow, Brother Michael, and now I know why there's a bruise this big on his <laughs> right side. It's years. been there for years. And there's a callus thick, thick. Yeah. you know. And it was when I, when I said, when your wife says she didn't hear you, eh, husband, <laughs> is that that's a form of communication, isn't it? A touch, a hug, a handshake, a smile, a frown, a glare. That's all communication. Even a a grunt or a groan or a mmm, this is good. 
this is delicious. And because sometimes we don't have words to describe. I went to a place that was called, oh, what was it called? And I thought about it. When we were in Miami and it was an ice cream st store. And usually I'll go for gelato, but it was homemade ice cream. Oh, man, don't you want to go to Salt and Straw right now? Let's just quit. <laughs> no, it's, it was like sweet and spicy or something like that. I'll have to think of it. And I didn't realize it until we went there. It was one of those places that's really famous on TikTok and on, on the Internet because their desserts are decadent. But the ice cream was so good that I wanted to go back the next morning, but they weren't open yet. And we had to go. See, that's one of the cool things about going on a cruise is you can get ice cream almost any time of the day. So just a selling point. But communication is it's verbal and nonverbal. And this is the beautiful thing. Have you ever felt God touch you? We feel that, right? Maybe you feel it tonight. Sometimes it's like you wonder if God touches different people differently because I've seen people that they're just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And they just move like crazy. There's a lady that attends the, the Corvallis Church. Now, when I get as a kid, you got to understand, my, my grandparents lived in the Corvallis area, and so I went to church there occasionally when I was a kid. I mean, I'm talking 50-some years ago. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to be honest here because I think my grandparents moved there in 1967. So it was 50 some years ago. I remember going to that church and this sister went like, oh, oh, oh. and you'll see her at camp meeting. If you go to camp meeting, she's still that way. And I said, thank you for worshiping Jesus the way you do. And I can't remember her name. Sister Debbie might remember her name, but she's, she's still the same. And we're 50 some years later, but uh, Billy Cole, he was one of our, a speaker that led many to receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He says, uh, uh, Shirley and I could be sitting together and praying, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost will fall, and I'll just go, mm -hmm, Lord, and she'll go, oh, 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 Jesus, oh, oh, did you feel that, Billy? <laughs> yes. Well, how come you're not moving? I'm just different. <laughs> so, that's the way we are. So this isn't a critical thing. It's an observational thing. In a church service, it's the same. Yes, it is. And I know some of you that, and, and I'm a people watcher. And again, it's not to be critical. It's because I want to help you get to the place that you want to get to. Is Some people don't cry very often. And some people cry when they're happy and when they're sad. Yeah. And then so you just got to really look at Christina and say, well, she's happy or sad, one or the two, but she's... <laughs> Feeling emotions, so we're happy about that. And that's great. And, and we need to feel God more, where there's others that are very pragmatic. I remember my wife's grandfather, and it moved me. Uh, we went to Rock Creek just before I received my license. And uh, I remember having morning prayer, morning devotion. Dear God, touch David and Lorraine today. You see where they are, cover them, provide for them. And then he'd move on, just very methodical. But that's your dad. That's who he was. It, he wasn't Mr. Emotional. In fact, he was so not Mr. Emotional, even in his preaching, and he was a great preacher. I remember my, now, I, I knew this before, when I met you, this is what I found out. My mom said her parents were visiting in Billings, Montana, and my wife's grandfather, I believe, was the district superintendent of the old Northwest District at that time, which is really kind of cool, is that he was invited to preach in Billings. And my mom's parents were visiting, and she said, I'm going to take my parents to church because Brother Reynolds has really stayed and really calm, and he won't scare them. <laughs> And he got up and read his text, and he took his suit coat off and rolled up his sleeves and started yelling. <laughs> That's odd, isn't it, Dad? That's very unusual. And my, my mom told me that. So that's kind of out of character. But occasionally we get out of character. But for the most part, we are the same. And so we respond to God. We laugh. We cry. There's some people I've never seen them run around the church and other people. They're going to run. 
they're going to jump. They're going to shout. They're just going to have a good time. And that's all right. We do anything but scream because we don't want mixed emotions. We don't want people confused about what's going on here in the house of God. So prayer is not just, prayer is an event. It's not just a ritual. It's not just a time to unload on God, but prayer is true communication with our creator. And remember, he knows you. He made you. He created you like you are and for a purpose. And so don't beat yourself up if you cry every time and say, man, I wish I could hold it together like they. Well, maybe they need to unload a little bit. But don't judge your brother and say, well, I wish they'd show some emotion once in a while. Well, you don't know how their emotions work. So at times, the greatest teacher of prayer is the circumstances of our life. When we arrive at a time of great need or extreme stress, and we grasp for a new way to communicate or try to, with greater desperation, to communicate with God. And we're forced out of our comfort zone because we're desperate. It's like coming upon an accident. We do things that we never thought we'd do. I remember we were on our way uh, to Central Oregon. We were going on vacation, and we were right by Detroit Dam, and Detroit uh, Lake is on the right-hand side, and, and there's cliffs on the left-hand side, and we came around the corner and slammed on the brakes because there was a wreck. It, we saw it happen, this little Honda, one of the old Hondas, the Civics, you know, little tin can, little tiny thing, had come around the corner, and it had been hit by a truck, and it spun, and it was sideways in the road. So I slammed on the brakes, and me, I, I don't know any better but to just go get involved. Forget the Good Samaritan Act or whatever it is. So I ran over and another guy ran over and I looked and the lady uh, in the passenger's door, her scalp was peeled back from here to about here. Like half of her scalp was peeled back. But thankfully, it wasn't just totally gone. You could kind of pull it over. And well, how would you feel if you had male pattern baldness? I mean, here it was... I'm just telling you what happened. Well, when, when stuff like that happens, it, it, it's kind of creepy, but something happens in my adre adrenal glands, and, and I just kick in and say, I'm going to do something. Well, she couldn't get her out, and there was steam coming up, and I'm thinking, well, it could catch on fire. We don't know what's going on. And I started talking to her, and she was in enough shock. She, she didn't see that, and I was had myself together enough that I didn't point out to her, hey, do you know that half your scalp is gone? You know, you just don't do things like that. You just say, okay, we're going to take care of that. So uh, I said, you calm her down to the guy that was with me, and I just pulled on the door, and we just pulled, pulled the door backwards because it was so bashed in, you couldn't get her. We, and, and her knees were crammed up underneath the dash and we moved the seat and we got her out. Thankfully, there was a doctor there. And once we got her out, the doctor came to assist. So uh, that was something that I did that I, 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 I'd never done before. I hadn't practiced it. I hadn't, you know, what am I going to do? I, I, I didn't sit up at night saying, what am I going to do if somebody gets in a wreck and their scalp gets spilled back? You know, that doesn't even enter our thinking. But when it happened, you just kick in and you jump in and you do whatever you have to do. That's sometimes the best teacher. If you're under stress, just go dump your heart on God. And you'll find new ways of communicating to God. And again, it's utterances, it's gestures, it's words that we give to him. Perhaps you've called out to God in prayer and felt that he was unreachable, or you lifted your voice and sensed that he was not hearing, or you called to God and it appeared he wasn't even, he, he was hearing, but he really wasn't hearing you. You know, like the spouse. Hello? Did you hear really what I said? Because you told him something. They go, okay. And you're going, I thought they'd fall off the couch because this is pretty dramatic. Well, no, they heard what they said. But at best, at, at the best, of times, this experience we call prayer lifts our mind and our spirit into the realm where we hear God and God hears us. And we have direct contact with the creator of the universe. So we've got to remember who we're talking to, the creator of the universe. That's humbling. That he, creator of the universe, would say, I'd like to have a conversation with you regularly. When you have a need, you come and tell me. 
And when I have something I'd like to give you as an assignment, I want permission to say it to you too. Whether it's something to do in my personal life or to impact the life of others. So to be sure, there are times when it seems as though God does not hear us when in reality he has and perhaps has already sent his messenger to speak to us or has been working on the solution before we even said it because he knows what we have need of before we even pray. Now, this prayer thing is such an important thing and sometimes it's underrated. We... we and this isn't disparaging about anything that happens in our worship experience. We come and we raise our hands and we begin to exalt the name of Jesus. And that feeling just comes over us and, and that transports us. The reason God created music, by the way. And it's a mathematical equation, and I don't understand all of that, but they work the math out to make it the syncopation just right and the timing just right and, and even the notes and the direction in which they go in order to project a feel. That's why the song we sang, Left It in the Water on Sunday, we just all felt like dancing. I saw some of you that couldn't dance. You know, bro Brother Billy Cole said, I just go like this and shake my belly, and they think I'm dancing because it's <laughs> moving up and down. I, I'm just saying what he said, and I have a friend that'll say that too. He says, I'm dancing on the inside, and it, and it, it just lifted us, but we saw the representation of Hillary getting baptized, which by the way, she lives in Salem, and my wife is connected with Sister Noel J Dillon, and connected asked for permission to connect with her today, so she's going to have a church to go to in Salem. And we're going to be able to connect her. She repented. She didn't get the Holy Ghost. But that's what it's all about, is soul. So if you don't get discouraged, if you don't see Hillary showing up again, she lives in Salem. But we're going to connect her with the church. But when that happens, we relive what happened to us. And it, and it frees us and gives us permission to express ourselves in liberty. And, and isn't it wonderful? Because then, I don't know about you, but I can leave worship service and feel really good and even maybe have almost forgotten about some of the troubles because God designed that and prayer is designed to be just that emotional and sometimes just that intense it might not be quite that loud but there are times when we can be separated from God's answers to our prayer by barriers of our own making and I'm just going to land here in a few minutes, and it's going to take us another week or so, and I hope you'll take this journey with me, and it may be sometime during this that I'm going to pray publicly in front of you like I pray, and I'm asking God for permission to do this, and it's not an ego thing, it's not, a, 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 but I believe God's going to allow me to pray in the understanding and then pray with the Spirit. And what I want you to see is, at least for my life, the progression that happens in my life. And it's not always the same. You can go from zero to 60 some days. I watch some of you. You hit the prayer room, and you're talking in tongues immediately. And people are saying, how do they turn it on like that? Well, if you have a daily prayer life, when you get to the prayer room, it's just like, well, I'm here to intercede, and I'm here to say, God, have your way, and I'm here to say, Lord, let the gifts of the Spirit be in operation. Hey, anoint the worship, anoint the preaching, help me to be sensitive to the needs of others, you know, and we just go into that rhythm. Thank you. Sister Janice says, I'm done. Is that yours? No, that is my alarm. So let's stand. I didn't realize that the noise was on it. <laughs> I know a pastor that several years ago, and I wouldn't advise this, one of his friends called him in the middle of service because he had a hard time muting his phone, and the phone went off. And he's at the pulpit, so he answered it, and he said, Hello? Okay, God, I'll tell them. That 
one was my fault. You and I could, re, I'm going to refer just briefly to the sin of David. Remember when David fell with Bathsheba? That was an obstacle to God answering prayer. But there are other things that can be hindrances to the prayers of men and women. And I'm going to land on 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 19. And it's, um, there's three different versions, and I'm not going to read the complete versions, but I'm going to start with the King James Version. But there are some other versions that use some words that communicate fully what the writer is trying to say. And you've got to understand, when, P when the King James was uh, interpreted, it was from the Vulgate. The Vulgate came from the Latin, and the Latin came from the Greek and the Hebrew. In other words, there were words that they have... How many of you speak another language and there's a word in your language that there's no word for it in English? Look at that. You speak it and there's no word in English. That's, that's what happened in the translation of the Bible. Is that there was no word for it in English so they had to put a set of words in there. And our language has progressed. How Tweet? That used to be what a bird did. Now, there's a picture of the bird on Twitter, but tweeting is, you know, 140 characters. Now, I guess, you know, it's been increased. I kind of bumped myself off Twitter because I got tired of the mess. But uh, thank you, Brother Martin. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Uh, and I'm going to bounce around. Brother uh, Philip, can you put up the... Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 in the Living Bible Translation, it says, always keep praying. The Amplified Version says, be unceasing in prayer, praying perseveringly. Thank you. He's pretty good at following that. So you can see, uh, if we put it all together, it's just, uh, just keep praying with intensity. So pray without ceasing doesn't mean you're praying in Jesus' name as you're trying to order your latte because they're not going to understand what you're saying. <laughs> That's not what it's talking about. It's just this is a constant, this is a habitual thing. Verse 18 of the King James says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The Living Bible says, No matter what happens, always be thankful. And the Amplified Version says, and really is not a version, it's a transliteration. It says, thank God for everything, no matter what the circumstances may be. Be thankful and give thanks, for this is the will of God for you who are in Christ Jesus, the revealer and mediator of that will. Now that's wordy, isn't it? But it's good. It says, we're in Christ Jesus. So pray pers persistently, consistently, perseveringly, but be thankful as you pray. Yeah. One of the biggest barriers, I think, to receiving what we need from God is not being thankful. Yeah. And if you look at Romans chapter number one, which is the pathway down to reprobate, it starts with being unthankful. And then we become unholy. Thanksgiving is a good thing. That's why we've started this first Sunday of the month. Hey, we're going to have some testimonies from your brothers. And next month, it's Brother Nia. And I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Nia's testimony. I haven't heard it in years. But to see how that works. Now I'm going to read verse number 19. And I'm going to start with the King James Version. And it says, quench not the spirit. I remember years ago, a little kid said, pinch not the spirit. The Living Bible says, do not smother the Holy Spirit. And the Amplified Version says, do not quench, suppress, or subdue the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Brother Philip, for keeping up with me. So prayer is a regular thing, and it's a persistent activity. And thanksgiving is a necessary element. And it must lead us to the spirit realm. And don't. Pinch the spirit when you get there. Let it take you somewhere. And so next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about that praying with the understanding and praying with the spirit, which is 
can be intercessory prayer or can be uh, travail prayer. And, and I don't know if we'll go quite to that level next week. But what I want us to do is, is to refresh our ability to communicate with God. Because when we follow his pattern, we'll be more receptive to what his spirit would say. And again, if any of you would like to be involved in the prayer team, which means there's two things. All these visitors that come, like Annalise and Hillary that were here this Sunday, on Monday usually, Sister Yvonne sends out her text, please, please pray for Annalise. And Annalise had these requests. Pray for Hillary. She had these requests. So when, you're, when we're standing, there's 20 some of us on the prayer team. When uh, somebody is saying, hey, we do pray for your needs, that's how it gets accomplished. Or if there's an emergency, there's several on the prayer team that are members. They can post and say, hey, my friend's sick, pray for them. And we all know. Or I will sometimes post if somebody calls me and says, hey, we're gone to the hospital and this was what happens. I form a, a prayer request and send it. And people respond to that prayer request. And we try to, if there's an answer, respond that God answered that prayer. So if you want to be involved in that, you can text me. Or talk to me and say, hey, pastor, put me on the prayer team. And I'll send you a picture of that app so you can find it. Tell me if you're iPhone or if you're Android. I'll show, send you a link to it. And you can download that app. I will invite you. And you just accept the invite. And all of a sudden, you're on the prayer team. And you can make your, your uh, notifications as out loud like my alarm. <laughs> or they can just buzz, or you have to look at the app in order to see it. So, thank you for your patience. Dear Jesus, lead us, I pray, that when we speak next week and before we get there, we're going to look at First Thessalonians and we're going to pray consistently, persistently, fill our hearts with thanksgiving, and we will mouth that back to you and then let your spirit flow through us because we need your Holy Spirit. We need to be directed of your spirit. Lead us into that realm of the spirit where we can pray according to your will and see the miraculous accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen.